Hello and welcome to the European Tours Life on Tour podcast presented by Hilton with me, Andrew Cotter, bringing you conversations, chats with key figures from around the world of golf. Uh, today we are at the Cross Sur Sierra Golf Club in Switzerland, a beautiful location, and I'm delighted to say we've been joined by a beautiful guest, a six-time European Tour winner, former Masters champion Danny Willett is with us. Danny, hello. How are you? I'm all right, not too bad. How do you enjoy this week in this place? Uh, it's, a, it's a spectacular week. This is the one that... You know, we always try and get back for family come up the mountain. You know, it's a nice, easy week. You're walking around everywhere. You go eat the food. You have a couple of glasses of wine. You admire the scenery and um, and you play a bit of golf on the side. Mm. Do you tack on a little bit of an extra? Do you go up any mountains before? We that? we have done a couple of times before. Up, we've I've been all the way to the top of the glacier, then halfway up and stuff. And there's a restaurant half up there you can go and eat at as well. But um, with the two little boys, it's. Um, yeah, we're not going up there and then be trying to jump out the vernacular. So. Mm, exactly. Um, <laughs> teach me young. So uh, how's your how is your golf at the moment? Because obviously it's you know it's, it's it seems to be pretty good. You had a great finish at the Open Championship. And yeah, it's, it's it's getting a lot better. Um, you know, we've obviously had our ups and downs, and um, the work we've been doing with Sean Foley and, and, and Kev Duff has really helped to to get the body moving properly again to allow me to practice more, which has then obviously led to more gains in the fact that you can work for a bit longer and you can see the strides and you practice more and. Um, yeah, we're in a nice place um, all around, really. We've we've had a few decent results this year, nothing as as good as obviously last year in Dubai. But um, you know, we're always on the lookout to try and get better and try and do things better. And um, yeah, we just we, we finished in America now. We've come back to Europe for the next for the next half of the season. And we're gonna see we're gonna see how we get on. Perfect. Right. I don't know how much you know about Life on Tour podcast, but the clue is in the name that this is where we take you back. <laughs> Take Under hypnosis, if necessary, we take you right back to the start and uh, and sort of take you through your life. So, mm. Sh- Sheffield, thirty-one years ago, <laughs> thirty-one years, nineteen eighty-seven in Sheffield. Danny Will, Daniel John Willett was born. Is that uh, yeah, accurate? Is. So that far? is very accurate. Um, um, whereabouts in in Sheffield? Uh, I don't know Sheffield. I don't know what I'm asking. Yeah, it was just now, it's just at the hospital. I, I, they've, they've got three or four hospitals. I couldn't tell you. Even if it's still Jessup's where my little boys were born, then that's where it was. But I couldn't properly tell you actually. Jessup's is that not a Photoshop? The Jessup's, yeah, Jessup's oh. wing in Jessup's wing in, uh, in Sheffield Hospital. So, um, yeah, no, it's we used to live we used to live down towards Chapel Town Way, which was the side of Sheffield. And um, my dad was a vicar. Mum's a maths teacher. Um, you know, early part of life. I can't really remember as probably most people can't. Mm. Um, and I didn't get into golf until 10, 11 years old. Yeah. I didn't realise, um, because, you know, we have various, I mean, obviously commentators around me many times in the past. So I knew, obviously, that your, your father was a vicar, but I didn't know your your mum, as you mentioned, a maths teacher, she, she's Swedish. Swedish. So, yeah, Swedish. So she's, she moved over here when she was 19, married my dad. Hmm. And then they've been together now for 48, seven years, 48 years. Yeah, I can see the sort of... Uh, it's yeah, vague I'm trying to work out how old they are and when they met and what it was. It's about that. Okay, so do you speak any... I used to, yeah. Me and my brothers used to go to Swedish school. Our, our life was beautiful back then. We used to do school Monday to Friday, Swedish school on a Saturday and Sunday school on a Sunday. Wait, sorry, sorry. Right, <laughs> hang on a second. Let's 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 just rewind a little bit. Swedish school, there's a Swedish school in Sheffield? Basically, yeah. All the, all, the, all the Swedish people in the Sheffield area used to gather on a Saturday morning, mostly for the adults, I think, to chat and catch up. And then they used to give work to the kids to learn Swedish. Okay, so I, come so on, you was... must still remember a little bit of no, Swedish. No, I, I, I mean, when I'm there, I'm okay. I can get by-ish, but like... Words off the top of my head, I'm not great, but I, I, I'm better at listening and hearing. My grandma never spoke English, so whenever we were in Sweden, you either listened and you understood, or you had no idea what was going on. Do you have private banter sessions with Henrik Stenson? Like <laughs> I don't actually. He, he comes across every time he walks past, he'll say something slyly and look at me and see if I understand what he's saying. Okay. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I like that. So you mentioned anyway, so um, your sort of passage into golf. How did you get started? How old were you when you first played golf? Yeah, 10 or 11. I've got two older brothers, one younger brother. Um, and we played all sorts of sports. Two older brothers were bigger than me, couldn't beat him at anything. But golf was, we played in Wales when we used to go uh, to Anglesey for, for the summer holidays on, on a little nine-hole golf course and found that I was better than they were at it. So then that for me was like a little, oh, So know, then. It didn't, it didn't start in Sheffield then, it started on no, no, ho- holiday golf. Yeah, it was more just yeah, more just rental sets, go play, go to the driving range, hit a few balls and, and see how you get on and then go play nine holes on a par three course and if you enjoy it, fine. And we kind of did that for a few years and then um, you kind of really get into it uh, later on. When I came back to Sheffield, you, there was a golf course just up the road from my mum and dad's where Peter Ball, a PGA professional, um, was at called Burley. And I then I used to go there, there every day after school. I got hooked on it over the six-week holidays a couple of years and 
and found that I was pretty good, found that I was better than my brothers, which was nice, and then kind of thought, I'm not, you know, you play against the kids in your school at football and at other sports, and you know that you're not going to do anything with that. It's everyone's dream, I think, to be a striker for football when you're a kid, mm. and that happens to a minuscule amount of people because you've got to be extremely good, and I was awful. So right. um, it was then I played other sports, badminton, and table tennis, tried everything, and then golf really, really got hold of me and, um, and really kind of cracked on when I was kind of 13, getting there every day, working, chipping, putting, doing everything you do, just with a tube of balls, 20 balls, go hit them, walk down the fairway, go pick them up, come back, drop them out again, go hit them. Was that because you knew you were good at it, so it was enjoyable? Um, it was enjoyable, but I've also, as people who know me, I've got quite an addictive personality, I'm quite OCD, and I just... I found that it really annoyed me when I hit one bad. Then I tried to then work out why I would do that, and then that became an addictive thing of trying to make sure I didn't hit any bad and kind of go through that. And it just, before you know it, four or five hours have gone by, and you need to get back and have your tea before going to bed and going to the worst place on earth, which was school. Swedish school. <laughs> well, Swedish school on a Saturday, yeah. That was not the worst place on earth. Anyway, so um, we'll take us through your progress as an amateur then, because I know you won the English amateur, so was there, there was sort of... Uh, in pointers on the way before that, how successful were you as a junior? Um, not too. It's funny that my caddy Sam, um, we played a lot of Yorkshire and Sheffield boys golf, and he was miles better than me. A lot of my friends were a lot better than me from kind of fifteen to seventeen. Um, I just because I got into it, I think so late. You know, they'd all been playing since they were they were young kids, and so yeah, I got into it a bit later. And um, you found the progressions. I got into the Sheffield squad, then started having more um, more frequent coaching with Graham Walker, who did Sheffield and Yorkshire and England squads, actually, at the time, which was quite fortunate because he was just down the road. So, um, yeah, just kind of really progressed then through the fact that I'd just about finished ECSEs. So I kind of obviously frees you up for a lot more time to, to practice and stuff. And, yeah, I, was, I wasn't the best junior by far. Um, I really kind of... I worked really hard when I was 15, 16 to see how, how I could get to and if I wanted to go to college in America. And, you know, I finished third at Will Boys, which was probably my biggest achievement as a, as a junior. Um, before then getting into like all the men's squads and stuff and, and then having a couple of really nice years in America, so. Yeah, but the English amateur, you won that in 2007? Won that in seven, yes. That was when I'd come back from college. Yeah. I'd been in college for a year and a half by then. So what was the decision to go to, what prompted the decision to go to America? Um, I just, I was I was always being pretty independent and I, and I love the idea of being in a place where you were in class for a few hours in the morning and then the whole afternoon you were on golf courses that were lovely. The weather was great. This was Jacksonville? Just Jacksonville, but Jacksonville in Alabama, right. not Jacksonville in, in, well, in yeah, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Two very different places. Yeah. What is Jacksonville, Alabama like? <laughs> probably there's around uh, 20,000 people there and probably 16,000 of them are students. Mm. So it's a pretty small... Pretty small place. But I mean, when people think about America, when you think of America as a youngster and going to America, you, you perhaps think of Florida. You might think of New York or California. Alabama's a very different place. It's a very different place. Um, basically, we weren't, the, my mum and dad didn't have loads of cash and they offered me a 90% scholarship. Um, other places were offering 56% and then when you work out how much you've got to pay, um, the figures were astronomical really. Same as guys, I guess, going to university over here nowadays. Um, you know, we wanted to go there and to be truthful, we wanted it to be as, as cheap as possible so that I could go and get an education and play golf and not spend twenty five grand a year of my mum and dad's money. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. And how much um how much difference did it make to your game? Because college golf in the States it can be a pretty high level. Yeah, it was. I mean we were we were still a D one college, not a big D one college, but still D one. Um and it was it was brilliant. Um the independence of you have to get up in the morning, you have to be at the gym by six, you then have to be at your own classes, you have to do your own thing, you've got to, you know Unless you want to live in squalor, you've got to tidy your own room, you've got to clean your own stuff, you've got to do your own laundry. All that kind of stuff, I think, helps progress you for later on in life. Probably don't realise it at the time, you hate it. Mm. But um, we then got in a van, six of us, travelled all around the States, um, driving and playing golf tournaments week in, week out um, in, the, in the semester. Uh, and I, for me personally, I've been told all this, I spoke to the coach and stuff, and you know, you kind of think, well, on tour, what am I going to do? Well, I've been playing week to week in different countries, different conditions, different weather, different grass. How can that not be um, of benefit to you, doing that when you're 17 for a couple of years or however long you wanted to do it for, um, to see, A, if you could hack it being on your own and travelling the world on your own and, and, and that kind of stuff, and, and how kind of good you could get within golf when there's not loads of other stuff going on. 
you know, when you're at home and your mates are always asking if you're going to go out, go, you know, go play football, going out of the park, do whatever it was. Um, you know, I was I was either in the gym in America or I was on the golf course in America. So, you know, just that that kind of stuff. You kind of I started to then really dedicate myself properly to, to what I, I felt like I was going to be able to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, the aforementioned English amateur in 2007, that year, Walker Cup year as well. I mean, mm. on both sides, having looked at that, the Walker Cup side, there are some amazing <laughs> players on both sides. It was an incredible Walker Cup year, yeah. I mean, we came back from college, I think I won four or five times before Walker Cup that year, because I wasn't even in the selection process. I wasn't even in the top 30 selection process, because mm. I'd been in America. So I got back and had a really good summer, got picked, and then... You know, it was nerve wracking because I hadn't really spent much time with these guys because I'd been playing my golf in America. These guys had all been in in the UK playing the the the, the GB side. So even I'd, though if, even though you'd won, you maybe didn't feel that you. It was still, you know, Rory was still Rory was still obviously Rory, um, amazing. You still had so many guys in that team. Paz at the time, Horsey, Jamie Mull. The, the team was brilliant. And then you looked at the American team, and again looking back now, it's it's funny. It was uh, Billy Orshall, Webb, DJ, Ricky. Yeah. I mean, you look at the two sides compared, and I mean, there's probably some forty or fifty tour wins and majors and stuff between between that Walker Cup team. I mean, it is amazing looking at those two teams there because you never know uh, at the Walker Cup who is going to make it and who, and who, and who isn't. Did you feel that you were going to make it? What did you feel at that? I time? don't know. To be honest, I was still pretty. I was still pretty young. I think what was I back then? I would have been nineteen-ish, twenty maybe. Um, I was still pretty young, and I guess. Immature in golf, st- I would still class myself as immature in golf. Um, pretty mature as a person because I'd been away to college and I'd, I felt like I was pretty good in that side of things. But golfing wise, I was still, I'd still not played against these guys enough um, and beaten them enough as to where you were fully confident in what you were doing. I was, mm. I was, I was again, I was clearly, I was pretty good at the game, but. Um, I think it helped when a few of the guys turned pro that year and then you carried on playing golf for a bit and you got to world number one amateur that you kind of go, oh, right, I can, I am, I, I am pretty decent. Yeah, so when you were, as you mentioned there, when you were, became world number one amateur on the, on the amateur rankings, that must have given you validation. I presume by then you, you, you knew that you wanted to be a professional. Yeah, I definitely knew. It was the two tour events I played as an amateur. I Luckily, the, the, the tour were great in helping me with two invites into the tour. I got the Spanish Open because I won the Spanish amateur. Um, and I got uh, an invite into the Andalusia Masters uh, and finished, I think I finished 19th and 11th in them two that I played. You, you, you put a question mark on the end of that and you're looking at me as if I, I know. I was, I, I, was, I was wondering what it was. I think it's 19th and 11th. So, okay, um, I mean, I'm just going to say, yeah, absolutely, yeah, just, 19th just, just and 11th. A yeah. couple of top 20s. Yeah, and then from there you kind of go, you know what, actually, you know, two pretty good fields, mm-hmm. not amazing fields, but pretty good fields. And I was nervous, really nervous, especially Friday for some reason, because, yeah, you want to make the cup. I, I wasn't going to win any money, but you just more proof to yourself of, of where you are and how you're performing. Um, and, yeah, kind of, I, I think after them two, it was the decision that kind of summer was when I decided not to go back to the States but in my third year. It's interesting that transition you mentioned there and feeling almost immediately fairly comfortable as a professional because when suddenly you're playing for, for money, for your career, for livelihood, and you say you haven't come from a guilty background, did you ever feel a different pressure playing as a young professional to playing as an amateur? A uh, little bit. I was fortunate that when I turned pro, because I'd come off the back of a decent amateur career, I got a couple of nice um, sponsorships straight out the back, which were nice to be able to have a little bit of money in the bank there to, to use for travel and to, and to do things. Because I always said... You know, Graham Walker was my coach at the time, and we always said that you're only investing in yourself. So fly yourself nice, stay in a nice hotel, eat the right food, do the right things, and eventually that will then pay off. Um, instead of trying to scrimp and save, and you know, doing a seven leg journey to get somewhere because it's hundred quid cheaper or whatever. You know, so we I, I was always kind of not flamboyant, but I'd always definitely spend a lot of my money investing in in my golf game, whether that be the right team around me or or traveling, whatever it may be. So yeah, I felt comfortable in getting it. The pressures then of playing were more, I had seven starts, uh, I turned pro, I didn't go to college, turned pro, got seven starts on the tour. And that was kind of like, I always had it in my head that I was gonna go to tour school. I had to do all three stages. So I was like, well, at least seven events, we'll see what happens. Um, couple of nicer results, I think I made 90 grand. Not enough, obviously, to keep your card. Mm. And then, you know, you, you then then you've got real pressure. I, I think that the most pressure then is, is, is tour school yeah. for, a, for a young professional. Yeah, especially if you're going through all three stages. Um, obviously, you don't play well one or two rounds in the first stage. You're out another year, definitely. Yeah. 
Um, and I think them that 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 kind of four week stretch where the guys are get ready for tour school is a is a pretty nerve wracking time for yeah. most people. Now, like most players, um, you know, very few players have a, an absolute seamless trajectory. There are ups and downs. In two thousand nine, you you earned your card and you kept your card. It was a pretty yeah. good season. Yeah. Uh, but then, what, 2010? Um, 2010 was good. You had a good 2010 finish was a really good year. Um, as, as well, yeah. First year made, made, made Dubai. Second year made Dubai. Yeah. Third year got injured um, halfway through and had a couple months out. But then tried to, I was still trying to play through an injury because I was desperately trying to keep my card. I had no exemptions, no nothing. Um, and I think I ended up having a really good result towards the end of the year to mm. keep my card. Um, and I think I had 333 grand that year, I think it was, off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm going to say 91st in the order of merit, just off the top was? of my head yeah, as well. There you go. So. Um, and I think if you match the two, that's about where it finished. But at the time, I was right on the right on the cusp of being okay and not being okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think I had two or three nice results in the last four or five to make my card. Yeah. Took the entire winter off, rehabbed, got better. Um, uh, and then... Kind of had a couple of nice years then uh, after that where I felt better about the uh, about the game and the fitness. And you won in Cologne. Won was in that Cologne your first victory? Was the very first victory. Is that when it was? Twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Okay. Yeah. You should know these things. Don't I know, you? The years, the years, you know, are, are all blur. Yeah, the years are all this. I mean, I'm, this is my tenth year on tour now. It goes blooming fast. But you must remember the feeling of your first victory, and again, just an absolute validation endorsement of what you're doing. Thinking, right, I. I can kick on from here. I I belong here. Yeah, you do. I was yeah. I feel like that win was 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 pretty big. Cause I had a, I think I had a decent lead with nine to play, and the weather came in, and I I got really nervous and played horrendous on the back nine, mm. and scraped it round to luckily getting a playoff with Fraze. Um, and then yeah, it was a thing. It was a four or five old playoff with Fraser. And yeah, it was nice. It's you never know when the first win's going to come. You think it might come earlier. You don't know if it's going to come at all. And then to get it, yeah, a weight's lifted because you think right, I can do it. You know, let's try and crack on now and see if we can get a few more. Yeah. And then, in true golfing style, it doesn't happen for a few years. <laughs> yeah, as Marcus Fraser, you're talking about. For those who are wondering, if Fraser is Marcus Fraser, is he, there he is. He's a footnote in the Danny Willett history, Marcus Fraser. But um, as you mentioned, uh, you, I mean, it's a, it takes a little while. You had some good finishes, but yeah. the next victory was at uh, Ned Bank. Was that some... was Ned Bank in 2015? Yeah. Um, 2015. You're, you're so uncertain about. I'm getting there. I'm okay. getting there. Well, we're getting there. Exactly. When I ask you what year you won the Masters and you don't know, that's know, when yeah, we all start to get that's concerned. You know. I've signed enough of them flags and all that. That date's imprinted in my mind. But um, again, there we go. So it's uh, yeah. I say it takes a wee while to win again, but yeah, like you say, we had a lot of good finishes. Takes a long time because the guys are good out here. You know, you're not just going to pitch up and win. Some guys do. You Rory, Rosie, the guys when they pitch up week in week out, they are incredibly good at this game, and mm. they would expect to win more often than not. Whereas most of us, you know, winning. If you finish your career, and you've won two or three times. You've probably you'd probably pat yourself on the back and say you've had a nice career. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's it's not easy to win. Um. But yeah, 2015 Ned Bank was we 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 got in that event. It was the top 30 then on the order of merit. Um, so we got in that event. Uh, that was actually the start, I think, of the season after, was it? So we got, I think it was uh, December 2014. Right, it was a wrap. It was so. like a they did a funky switch and they they ended up putting Ned Bank in as like a not a winners category, but like a top 30 on the order of merit from the year before, which was a nice Brucey for the year after because you started <laughs> with some with some free cash. Um, but yeah, I went there, had a fantastic week. Um, love that place. Just, yeah. just had a had a good battle with Ross Fisher. I think it was on Sunday, yeah. um, and ended up coming out victorious there, which was you know a huge win, not only in monetary terms but in world rankings and yeah. in, in where it puts you because it was on the race to Dubai for the year after. Yeah, I was leading the race to Dubai for a hell of a long time because it was such a big prize purse at the time, mm. and that then gets you in more WGCs, yeah. majors, all of these things, and then kind of stuff starts to unravel nicely and you start to then really step up and play against everyone in the world, not just the guys in Europe. And that's when I think then you kind of go, right, this is a next step up. I'm not just playing um, against the 156 guys that I know in Europe. I'm now going out against, you know, yeah. the top 50 guys in the world, or, you know, a handful of times. And and it's interesting to then to see how, how you feel, how, how comfortable you are and, and then ultimately how good you can do. I just like the fact that we have got, I'm sure listeners around the world to this podcast are going, what did I say, a nice Brucey for the following year? <laughs> what on earth is a nice Brucey? Well, I, it, well, I could go into it. It's uh, just Google Bruce Forsyth and Brucey bonus. Anyway, so um, as you say, it gets you into the bigger events as well. You're moving into the bigger events. And then 
third place, the 2015 WGC match play. Yep. Yeah, kind of, kind of like yep. match Harding, play. So, Harding Park. Yep. Harding Park. Um, so then you get a, a special exemption for the PGA Tour. So you try to play a bit more over in America as yeah, well. Yeah, so if you get enough money up or points up, you then get to have unlimited invites. But um, how difficult is it to, where I'm going with that, is to play on both sides? Because a lot of players do it and it splits time and... It's it's difficult. I've done it this year for the first time ever. I've done it this year, but I've done it properly. Mm. So I actually moved over to America for six months, played there, played solely there. And then we've just moved back now to, to the UK to now play the last four months over here and it's hard it's traveling trying to keep everyone happy trying to keep your game in shape trying to keep your body in shape flying around it's it's a difficult one because you want to do so well wherever you play um and i think everyone's different and um it, it's, it's again it's a learning curve i tried to do it back then but i did it from the uk so i was traveling mm. a lot yeah. around the world to to play you know Manchester to Manchester to San Francisco, you know, and then you go San Francisco back to Florida for the players. Then you fly back home, and then you go to Asia to play some in Europe. Yeah. And it's, it's just really tough. So we then made a decision this year to then move out there and give it a go. And it's just it is it is difficult. The guys who do it well are the guys who are who are exceptionally good golfers who have got. Again, it helps when you're top fifty in the world and you get them guaranteed money events and you get the majors, you get the World Golf Championships. All of these things make it a lot easier. Um, and at the time, luckily, I'd just snuck into the top 50. So I was in, in a lot of these bigger events. Yeah. But you still then got to go up and realise that you're playing against better fields. Yeah. Um, and then you've then got to perform on top of that. Otherwise, you're just travelling around the world playing rubbish golf on your own. It's yeah. pretty... It's pretty... Yeah. <laughs> well, there wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't all rubbish golf. It wasn't all no, rubbish wasn't golf. All I mean, rubbish well, golf. you won here, didn't you, the, the, in 2015? Yeah. In two that, yeah, so we, yeah, we had a... Like kind of, I think by the time the playoffs had finished, and luckily, not well, luckily, unluckily, whatever it was, we weren't in them because you can't get in them if you've not won. Yeah. Then it gave me time to then come back home, settle back in, regroup, um, and then yeah, this was then um, this was then one of the events that I came back to, and I've always liked it here. From I think I've not missed this event now since I've since I've turned pro, since I've been eligible to play yeah. in it, um, and I've always liked the golf course. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was lovely to come back here and and perform how I thought I could perform. Yeah. Majors. So 2015 Open at St Andrews, actually, because we'll come to, obviously, the Masters. I had a, uh, had a, good, but, I had a good run. You had a good run there, mm. and uh, did you believe you had a, a a real chance? Did you feel that you... Yeah, definitely. We were. I think me and DJ were tied for the lead on on the third round, which actually happened on the Sunday because of the weather delay. Mm. Um, and then we both played pretty poor uh, on that day to move. We both dropped back a little bit. Uh, and then actually Sunday was Sunday was a big eye opener because I played with Zach on Sunday, mm. um, and Zach obviously won that won that open, and then you kind of go back after the week and you go right I finished sixth it's a nice result. What did I need to do to win? And you actually look, and Zach is a lovely golfer, but you look at Zach as a player, and what he does with a golf ball and he's not hitting it three fifty, he's not hitting four irons up his nostrils like Tiger used to and what Rory does and stuff like that. Zach plays his game and plays it extremely well. And then I think that kind of gives you a little bit of the confidence that um, I watched that happen. I watched it unfold. Yeah. I watched how everything went and, and, and how he did it. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't, not to sound ridiculous, but he didn't do anything special. special. He, he just did what he knew he could do. Yeah. Every hole, kept going until it finished. I gave him a lovely read on the last that he knocked in to get to, to, to get in the playoff. I'm still waiting for my bottle of wine. Um, and then yeah, you look back and I'm driving home, I had the family in the car, and you're driving home like I'm I'm tootling, I'm concentrating on driving obviously, mm -hmm. but you're tooting long, just kind of thinking, well, what about if this happened and this would happen, and then you start to kind of unfold and actually go, you know what, you, you wouldn't have had to try and do that stupid shot there that lost you, that made bogey, and you didn't you didn't have to try and do this, and I think that in itself was a nice was a really nice way of going about it in in actually being in one of the last groups in a major, seeing someone accomplish a dream mm -hmm. you know the yeah. emotion everything that goes with it and the nerves and everything um, and being part of it and actually being able to chat into him on the way around yeah. and going you know what this is if I actually I've got the game to get there because I got there after two days I yeah. know I can play good enough um, and then from then on you've just basically not going to do anything stupid just yeah. keep doing what you know you can do and you're going to have a chance at some point yeah. to, to, to have a go at one of these 
Perhaps this was in your head when you decided to name your, your firstborn Zach, that it was in, in gratitude or thanks maybe, to maybe, Zach maybe, Johnson. Maybe, just, yeah, just yeah. all for what Zach did for me. Yeah, maybe not. I, uh, I named him after him. Anyway, let's leap forward to the Masters then, because uh, 2016 Masters, so, well, I mean, interesting times in your life as well, because uh, Nicole was... She was eight and a half months pregnant, yeah. So, so you were, I presume you were thinking if Zach's hadn't arrived yeah. that you might not play yeah I said all along that I'd have not gone and played mm. um, you know it's, it's it's an amazing golf tournament but it's a golf tournament mm. and that was our first child um, I would have definitely been there at the birth and, and wanted to be there at the birth and luckily enough bless him he, uh, he came out on the 29th of March so he gave me just enough time to hit a few balls before, <laughs> before I left as well no it's considerate <laughs> good I hope he got a percentage so t- well tell I mean take us through that tournament because it was a remarkable Masters for so many reasons. I mean, let's just look at the final round because, um, I mean, Jordan Spieth had it in his hands. And yeah, when yeah. you were playing with Lee Westwood and you're looking at the leaderboards, are you at? I, I know you're obviously thinking, I can, I can, I can try and win this, but you're, everyone must be looking at him going, well, Jordan Spieth, he was the dominant player in the world at the time as well. Yeah, he was playing amazing. That was he, he was on a run in them last eighteen months or twenty four months of something like Brooks just had, wasn't he? He'd, he'd won three majors, something stupid, and he was playing phenomenal, hole and everything. And basically, yeah, me and Westy, I would have thought both would have looked at each other and, without saying it, gone, me and you for second then, yeah. you know? Like, <laughs> and this was when you're on, so you're on a, the 15th when he puts her in the water on the 12th. Yeah. And suddenly you find yourself, because he had a four-shot lead. Four-shot lead? He had a five-shot lead at one point, yeah. I think, yeah. And then, yeah, going down the back nine. And, yeah, we'd played, the, we'd played 10, 11, 12 well, level par, which is good for them. Holes on a Sunday when the wind's everywhere. Birdie 13, birdie 14. Mr. 12 footer on 15 for birdie. And as we put the flag in, yeah, you look round and there's a big 50 foot scoreboard. Uh, obviously nothing electronic at Augusta, so it's all hand done. And so they flip the numbers out and everyone's thinking, is he made birdie or whatever? And then they flip them back and everyone wondered if the guy behind the thing had got it wrong. So when the roar goes up, because it was sort of a roar mixed with ooze, because they were everyone was expecting... A different crowd, different yeah. Different crowd. So what were your... Th- Feelings immediately at that moment, walking to the 16th tee or whoever it was when you first saw the board. My heart started racing. Um, I needed a pee, so I went to the toilet behind the back of 16, which is eerily quiet um, for everything that's going on. And you know, you just you kind of say to yourself, "Well, I did say to myself, you know, you've been in the position. You're not going to do anything stupid. Um, you've got five more good swings to make." I actually um, almost saying that you're almost saying this out loud. Almost you? saying it out loud whilst having a wee. Um, Basically, look, you practice for this. You know you've got these shots in the bag. You've got five more good swings to make. Um, keep your foot down. See if we can keep. See if we can make a birdie on the last three holes because they're not the easiest holes. Um, and really try and keep that momentum going and not back off. I, I don't know. I don't know how good I would have been sleeping on a lead of a major that early on. Um, but having got to that kind of point so late, I don't think you've got time to really process it as much. So you can, uh, our, our focus all day was to keep making birdies and see what happens. Mm. Um, never really thinking that there was going to be enough enough ground to make yeah. up that we would be able to. So then when you actually get to the front, you, you the mindset was, I, I kept it pretty good in that. I still wanted to make birdies. So, you know, five good swings and, and there we go. And then luckily one of them good swings came at the, the, as soon as I'd washed my hands and relieved myself on the, uh, on the 16th tee. Good, I'm glad we went, <laughs> we went, down, the, we went down that one. The cleanliness. Anyway, so, uh, but the fact that you're playing with Westwood as well, I mean, he's a great player, especially around uh, Augusta as well. Suddenly he's your main rival, mm. although because you would have known him very well as well, did that make it more comfortable? It was, yeah. I've, I know I know Westy and Billy really well. Um, and I don't think that I could have asked for or he could have asked for. If one of us would have won there, I don't. I think we'd have both been as happy for each other as what what, what we were. Um, it was a very comfortable situation to be in. Um, if I'd have been playing with Tiger in that moment, mm. particular moment, um, and it had been that role, I don't think you may have been potentially as comfortable. I don't know. We, we weren't. But I can only imagine that I wouldn't have been. So it was nice that, yeah, that it was that, that there was friends there around me. When all, when everything was when everything was going on. So I mean, you go on to win, but there was waiting, and there was those famous where you were FaceTiming. I was trying to FaceTime Nick. Yeah, they yeah. were all, they were all they were all awake at home watching it, yeah. and I was trying to FaceTime. But obviously the, there was a, there was a lot of not that I don't know what it was, but there was the phone signals were out and stuff, and I'm trying to FaceTime her and watching the TV at the same time, and I ended up I ended up I think I ended up dinking her. 
to make sure that I can watch what Jordan's doing on 17 yeah, and 18. Whatever, just go on. It's okay, I'll call you back in five when, yeah. <laughs> when we know. Um, yeah. yeah, and then obviously, I was going over the scenario, right? Because he had a great shot into, into 16. And I think if he'd have made that, I think it could have been a really different mm. story. Um, but he missed that. And then 17, I'm thinking, right, well, if he makes birdie here, he can make birdie up the last. And all the scenarios, and then hit it in the front trap. And then I'm like, right, well, if he holds this, and then he does this. And eventually, when he, when he makes bogey on 17, that was physically impossible for him to win. So that's when Johnny came running in and, yeah. and jumped on me on the sofa. Jumped on you on the sofa, famous shot. So, um, you know, you have no clarity at all about certain years that things happen. Do you still have absolute clarity in your mind, the feelings immediately after? I could almost tell you the numbers, what we hit. Yeah. where the wind was yeah. yeah it's yeah strange how golf is isn't it there's i can tell you the shots i hit and, and what it was but yeah years and bits kind of blur but what, certain moments obviously stick in well what was the immediate feeling though of having won the masters was it a shock really yeah. um i never in a million years expected jordan to mess up so i never expected to be in the situation that i was in 45 minutes before that anyway so then to get ready for that feeling of the emotions was just it was a weird like shock of this should just happen but, what do we do now <laughs> yeah. well you're taking through things yeah, aren't you you're pushed away through, enough yeah, to yeah, meet Jim very, very formal and stuff. <laughs> yeah it is very formal um, yeah and it was just it was just the realisation of what had just happened and I don't think that sunk in for a long long time yeah. um, but the immediate thing was just ultimate relief not relief happiness exhilaration every, all these things just low just a big cauldron of emotion of everything going on and like, yeah, you probably, I think if anyone would have seen me, you'd just a bit starry eyed yeah. and wondering what just happened again. Well, it's interesting talking to various players about their feelings after winning their first major. Mm. Because for a lot of them, they say, it's never quite what I thought it was going to be. I didn't know what it was going to be yeah. like, but it's not quite what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it depends on, again, because I finished so early, mine was very different. I think if you hold a 15 footer on the last to win or in a playoff or whatever, and you do one of these miraculous things like Tiger did at the US Open when he hold that when he hold that stupid curling put in two thousand and eight, mm. and everyone went mental. Something like that, maybe. But you know, I was sat watching it on TV. I'd already done my stuff. I couldn't do anything else. So I was completely helpless. I couldn't do anything. You know, I needed to hire one of the guys at Happy Gilmore and go and try and heckle him to see if he could do anything. There's nothing I could do. Mm. I've just I've got to watch my fate being played out in someone else's hands, yeah. and it's a weird it's a weird sensation. Yeah, but, but what's it like in the days, the weeks, the months afterwards as well? Because suddenly you're introduced everywhere, and you're you're going to Wimbledon, and you've got the green jacket, and are you you treated differently? You feel different? Um, yeah, you do. There there is a good sense of pride that you wear and you wear that jacket. You try and wear it well. You try and take it to the right things and do the right things by it. Um, it was crazy afterwards. I don't. I didn't realise how big it, of a deal it was back in the UK um, until we got back home and it was we were just accosted mm. everywhere and paparazzi outside the house and everything like that and it was it was a bit crazy for a, for a few weeks. Um, did it affect your form winning the Masters afterwards? Uh, it affected it, it not I mean it did affect the form but it more more so affected me and then that then affected the form more so affected me and that I was being watched. Every time you hit a golf ball, every time you went to a putting green, every time you went to a chipping green, everywhere you were being watched. Because you won the first major of the year, you've got the Grand Slam chance. Yeah, good one. More um, demands on your time as well. You know, well. And it, yeah, I, I wasn't... That's the one thing that got, that we, we practice hours on hours on hours on uh, on our golf games, trying to get that good. No one actually ever tells you if these things do happen that, you, that you're practising for, how to actually manage that side of it. Um, and, and, and yeah, the time stuff and I then went and travelled and played golf around the world because people want you to go play. Um, and it wasn't, yeah, if, I'd, if, well, if and when I do it again, then I think I'll do things a little bit differently. Now you, I'm sure you look back at the Masters as a standalone, but if you look back at 2016 as a year, it was one of highs and, 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 and lows as well for you. Because, there, I mean, the Ryder Cup was, from a European point of view, in Ooh, 2016. Was... <laughs> oh, we've gone back to Ryder Cup. We've gone straight to Oh, it's straight taken to me three years to get, to, to get rid of that out of my mind. <laughs> I've used your clip from that press conference innumerable times. Anyway, so, but that, how hard was that Ryder Cup for you personally, because it's a team event, but it seemed to be that you were the target. And and for those who don't know the background, I mean, everybody I think does know the background and be listening, is that um, there were other things coming in because your brother, Pete, who's a great writer, had written a satirical article on, on American fans. So suddenly you were a, 
a target for a lot of the American supporters. Yeah, and I think that was just that. Again, I don't think you realise until you go to the Ryder Cup how on edge everybody is and how much people want something to happen to give them an excuse to be ridiculous in how they act, personally. Mm. Um, I think if nothing had come out, I still think the crowds are obviously incredibly pro-America and incredibly pro-Europe when they're in Europe, and that's how it should be. Mm. But that I don't think it has to go down the roots of being rude and obnoxious because at the end of the day, it's still golf. And mm. we, you know, that's not... It's not how we play. It's a very different game to other things. You wouldn't sit in the crucible yelling stuff because it's not what you do. You go to a football match and do it because there's 90,000 people and 11 guys are 100 yards away from you. You can't hear it. But when you're four yards away from someone on a tee box, it's a very different atmosphere and a very different feeling um, to, to many other sports. So, yeah, it was targeted more at myself, I think. But not, not only me, I think a lot of the guys that week got Got a, got a lot of nonsensical stuff um, said, said to them or, or, or done to them or whatever it may be for for no reason, which is a shame because, you know, it's uh, at the end of the day, like I said, it is a gentleman's game and we play it with the utmost, utmost respect. And, um, yeah, obviously my week was quite well documented as being... <laughs> as being poor. <laughs> poor, that's how you describe it in the poor. British comments. I'm going to say poor. So how's this week been for you, Danny? It's been poor. <laughs> well, I don't know, but it's a classic case as well of things off the course affecting play on the course. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I wasn't playing very well. Mm. So I think if I'd have gone there and I was playing brilliantly and I was really confident in my own game, I think I would have been able to brush everything off a lot easier. But at the time, there's no excuse. I was playing poor. I was playing bad golf. I was... Me and Pete Cowan were on the range for hours. We snuck off to different sides of the golf course, certain tee shots I didn't want to hit, this and this. I was really struggling in, in my game, which played out towards the end of 2016 when I didn't really want to play. Mm. Um, so, you know, it was it was just a bit of a mixture of all of that kind of together. Mm. Like I said, I would have loved to have gone there playing great and just got my head down, knuckled down and, and really done well for the team. Um, and it was just such a shame for me personally. Yeah. You know, that I wasn't able to, to, to do anything and yeah. give anything that week. Um, regardless of what happened off the golf course, I think it was just a, it was just a, the week for me just wasn't, um, yeah, wasn't that enjoyable. Yeah. In the end. But also the fact that Pete was brought into as well, not Pete Cowan, Pete, your brother, because it strikes me that you're quite a close, close yeah, family. Yeah, we're a close well. family. He's, a, he's an incredibly good writer. It was taken completely out of context. And, you know, within that, it like I said, it was just a real shame how how it all went and how it all ended and how we had to deal with it and everything that, that kind of went around it, but, you know. Yeah, and then after, so let's, moving on to 2017-18, I, I mean, everywhere you go, as you say, as a Masters champion, people are very keen to not write people off as one major wonders, but you must have had the, felt that feeling that... I said it to myself. We well, said it to everyone. Crying. <laughs> Danny Willett is keen to write himself off. No, but I mean, you feel that pressure, and then injuries are creeping in as yeah, well, yeah. and your form goes down, so difficult times to deal yeah, with. Yeah, difficult times mentally to deal with. Um, you then, yeah, I was struggling. You put more time in at the gym, trying to get better, trying to rehab everything. You put more time in at the range, trying to get better. Within doing that, I spent less time at home, less time with the family, you know, and then... And then you're away. You're not playing. You've travelled half around the world to play a golf tournament. You don't know if you're going to be able to play when you get there, if your back's going to be any good. So you've travelled away from your newborn and your wife, playing poor, mm. feeling rubbish, to go there to maybe play two rounds and fly back. And just, there was loads of stuff coming in. And yeah, the golf wasn't really, I wasn't really fancying mm. doing much and playing much. The motivation was down. Um, yeah, we just did, we just did, we just a poor time, really. Um, yeah. Which is unfortunate because it's a game that we, that we take up because we love. Yeah, but it is, you're always seem to be on the, uh, all players seem to be walking a tightrope all the time in terms of confidence as well, when yeah. injuries creep in and then you get into a bit of a downward spiral. Yeah, exactly. So then I just, I took it up on myself to, to kind of change up my people around me. Mm. Um, started working with Kevin Duffy, um, Dave O'Sullivan and, uh, and Sean Foley and together kind of put a programme together as to where we got the body back to full he fitness and mm. full health. And within that, the golf swing changed, yeah. um, but the body was first. Yeah. Um, and then we'd work the golf swing around it. So, um, you know, straight away, I saw signs of the body getting better, which then, funnily enough, lightened you up a little bit yeah. to accept a few more things. And you know that you're on a better path and you start feeling a little bit better, thinking a little bit more clearly about things. And, um, and the clarity then gets back within what you're trying to do with your golf. And it's a long process. It took, yeah. took 18 months at least yeah. of hitting it horrendously, yeah. but the back feeling better. So then there was always a positive within it 
yeah, I've, I've shot 78, whatever. But I've come off and I've not needed to be on a physio bed for two hours. Yeah. And right, I've, so I've now done that for one day. Can I do it for two days? Can I do it for three days? Can I do it for a week? And that was then the process in how long can I do before I've then got to get back on a physio bed. And it got to the time now where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm basically don't need to go on a physio bed ever, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. But uh, I, you mentioned the changes uh, in terms of coaching, but a caddy change as well. And the caddy is also uh, seems to be the most important. I mean, players and caddies do change quite often, but it's the most important relationship. They're the guy you spend most of the time with. Mm, yeah, me and John split. Um, again, probably mostly because I was playing a bit poorly. I probably was being um, not myself on a golf course. We can all be a bit mean. <laughs> are you, do, do you think you are times. demanding of yourself, but demanding of others a bit difficult at times? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm incredibly demanded of myself. And because I'm demanded of myself and I know how hard I'm working, I would expect the people to be working for me to be as good as what I'm trying to be and as professional as I'm trying to be. Um, and it just didn't quite, you know, we were, we were good friends. John was best man at a wedding. Um, you know, we were good friends and it just, it, it was one of them stages where, I, yeah, I don't think I was helping the situation at all and we split. And then uh, my other best man at a wedding <laughs> came on the bag. Um, but no, me and Sam have known each other for 20 years. Um, and And he actually came on the bag firstly to make sure that I was okay. Was his he's got these godparents and to to Zach, he actually came on the bag just to make sure that as a friend, um, I was actually travelling the world with a friend and not mm. on my own. So I didn't realise they'd both been best men at a wedding. This is I a... had two. I couldn't work out which one I wanted to do. <laughs> Sam's uh, Sam's been my best pal for years. Not quite sure if I could have trusted him to to sort all the arrangements out. So John came in to sort all that stuff out. Okay. They'd have made a good partnership. Okay. So future caddies and usher are page boy. Yeah, flower whatever girl. it might be. Yeah, flower girl might be might be the way forward. So anyway, let's move to Dubai then last year because uh, it's a big, big tournament to win anyway, but all the bigger because of where you had been, as you've said yourself, in a pretty dark place. Yeah, yeah. The kind of the form had been coming back slowly. We had a couple of nice top tens. Finished finished seventh actually in Turkey to get into Dubai. Because again, we weren't in it. We, yeah. I was just happy to be playing nicely and be pain free and, and, and traveling again and enjoying golf. So yeah, finished nice in Turkey to actually get into Dubai. Um, and then, yeah, just a strange, just a, again, one of them bizarre weeks where that golf course theoretically shouldn't suit me. Yeah. Um, we don't hit it as far as, as a lot of guys and, and do certain things, but I was incredibly relaxed. I knew that I was in a good place regardless of what was going to happen that week. I was going to have a winter off to be able to then keep working with Sean, keep doing the right things. And, and I knew I was going to take my PGA Tour card and I knew we were going to move to America. So there was other things going on. Um, and I went there and played um, some, some lovely golf for, for four days and, um, and really was able to flip the bird at quite a few people, well, I would so imagine. I, well, I was about to ask because there, were, uh, there, there will have been, there were lots of people, not me, I always said you were going to yeah. win again, but well, there, were, there will have been lots of people who will have kind of almost written you off. Um, yeah. So it, it is kind of, as I say, it's for yourself, but it's to say to others, no, no, I'm, I'm still here and I can still win. Yeah, it's, you know what? It's, it's a strange old scenario, isn't it? Other people's opinions shouldn't really matter, but for some odd reason we look at them these days and they, they do seem to matter at times and um yeah you do it for yourself and more, more so than others but it was it was very rewarding to to be able to to do that and to show to myself and to show to others that you know I didn't just win a couple of golf tournaments and then fob it off it was I'm still working incredibly hard at home and I'm still wanting to to win more golf tournaments and um and the work that I was doing I knew that the change I had made was right because I could see a, a, a better path and I could see it clearer the win is, again, shouldn't matter because you should just be happy with where you are at that moment in time and what you're doing. But, you know, it is always nice to get that, to get the results, yeah. to, to be able to to put your name down on a, on a trophy again and to stand there and to have all, all of that stuff go on. The feelings that happen within it with nine holes to play, being in proper contention and, mm. and having a chance to accomplish something that you weren't sure if you're going to be able to accomplish again. It's, yeah. Nice. Listen, I know we're, we're, we're running fairly short of time because you've got to go and work out an extra 10%. The ball goes here, so you've got to uh, go and do your yardage. We'll have a guess. If it's okay. a back flag, it sits. We well, or if it's a front flag, it well, sits. Let's, let's quickly race <laughs> to this it. year because very good performance at Port Rush where you, yeah. uh, you, you must have thought, okay, I've got another chance here. Yeah, I mean, Shane, I was always, he, mm. obviously always uh, too far in front, but it was a, it was a chance for a good finish. Um, and, and again, for me playing both tours, it was a big finish to be able to then get points on both sides of the pond. So 
yeah, great week, fantastic crowds, an amazing golf course, what they've done. Um, I'm glad that they've got it back on the rotor. Um, sorry, but on the rotor now, because um, I've played there a couple of times. Um, yeah, just yeah, we've had a few nice results now. US Open was the same, decent yeah. result there. So, yeah, the game is is in is in a better place. Like I said, we've now moved, we we up and moved. We came back on Saturday, so we're still a little bit jet lagged, but we came back Saturday now for the remainder of this year to to play back in Europe. So excited to be back, not where you belong, but where I would class home as properly, and yeah. um, to see all the guys and, and and to come and play on 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 the golf courses that I've played at for the last ten years. So. How is living in the in the states now? In, in... It's good, yeah. We bought a place in in Windermere near Isleworth, and um, you know it's it's ninety degrees every day. The kids are enjoying it, being in the pool every afternoon, and it's a, it's 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 still slightly strained because we've still not got our hub of friends and family around as close. But people have come out to travel and come out to spend mm. time with us, and um, I think the six months and six month thing could could work all right. But we'll see. Are you near Tiger's old house? Uh, we're not far. What? I'm not going anywhere. I get a, a, a pal, a pal, a pal that I played against in the member guest actually lives in his house. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh. It's funny actually. He's got a great guy. Bubba, Bubba actually lived there as well. Okay. Bubba bought it off Tiger, and his Bubba famous. Watson, I didn't realize he. he bought... Yeah, Bubba lived there, and the, his famous comments. This gentleman that I, that I play with at Isleworth was, yeah, I've just I bought Bubba's house off in between me, Bubba and Tiger. We've got about. 16 majors. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It off and, fair enough. On, so. and one famous driveway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so what do you do then when you're over there? How do you, I didn't, another thing I didn't realise about this, uh, so much stuff I didn't realise. I didn't realise, I thought as a Sheffield man, you'd be a fan of the Owls of the Blades. I didn't realise you were a Liverpool fan. My dad was a scouser. Ah, right. So we've just all been brought up that okay. way, that way inclined. So how painful was, uh, I'd say painful last season, domestically last season? What would you, okay, so if I were to offer you, I'm not going to offer you an, uh, another major or Liverpool winning the league, because you would, would, that would... That would be silly. That would be silly. So <laughs> let me offer you, let me offer you a Ryder Cup victory uh, with you playing a key part or Liverpool winning the title. No, a Ryder Cup. I'd like to get, I'd like to get my own back on that golf tournament. All right, I'm trying to, okay, I'm trying to think, what, what have I got left as a bargain? Make the, make, make the cup this week or Liverpool. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we'll take Liverpool. Okay, <laughs> right, sorry, you take Liverpool. But anyway, so uh, that's one of your outside pursuits. What do you do when you're not playing golf? Nah, you know what? Uh, we used to go a good bit, my brothers, to the Champs League matches on the Wednesday night, but we haven't been for a good while. Just mm. They've all got kids now, I've got kids now. It's trying to get time to go and get over there and do it is, is, is pretty tricky, but... Um, we try and do bits, but no, at the minute, in fairness, because we travel so much and life's so busy, when, when we're not playing golf, you, you want to lock the door and you want to yeah. do nothing, really, okay. and just be be yourself. And do you see the future in America? Do Zach and, is it Zach and Noah? Yeah, do Zach and Noah, I don't know. American accents? Nah, we'll see. It might be that we do it for a few years and then come back when they start school, just, you know, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how right it is to keep them away from grandparents and bits and bobs. Me, us living in America is partially a selfish ordeal for me to practice more with foals and to have the weather to practice in and stuff like that but mm. you know we're grandparents sick. in Sweden <sighs> what Do you know? no Sweden's too cold that time of year oh, I can't go there that time of year anyway listen I think we're, we've got to finish we've got um, a Hilton quick nine to finish this so, quick very, nine. nine very quick questions just first thing top of your head so uh, question number one on the Hilton quick nine is first thing in your suitcase shoes question two favourite club in the bag either Question three, where was your last holiday? Bahamas last week. Okay. Question four, favourite hole in golf? <laughs> Is it really cliche to uh, say 12 or 16? <laughs> uh, I'll go 16 because I made birdie. 16, there we are. Yeah, the, uh, okay, where the Westwood lost hole. Uh, the, fifth, the fifth hole on the Hilton Creek Nine. One place on your bucket list. One place you'd like to go that you haven't been. New Zealand. New Zealand, I think a couple of people have said that. <clears throat> can't remember who said that. I don't think Ian Poulter could come up with any place. Uh, question six in the Hilton Quick Nine: Best shot you've ever hit? Huh. Um, the next, uh, the actually, next one. No, actually, that's, what you're supposed yeah, to say. that's a good one. No, seventh, seventeenth in Dubai last year. Seventeenth in Dubai. Your seventeenth shot on the par six. three fourth hole. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, the seventeenth hole. What did you do in that one? Six iron to about six feet, but again under, you know, pressure. under pressure, needing needing to do something. So. Okay, question seven: If you weren't a golfer, what would you be? Skint. 
Question eight: Ryder Cup victory or Liverpool winning the Premier League? I've kind of done You've that done already. Done that one. Sorry. Ryder okay, Cup so that's a double. So I changed my answer to say Liverpool. Liverpool. That's okay. oh, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll skip over that. And the final hole, the ninth hole, and finally, who would make up your dream four ball? And again, it says in brackets, dead or alive. So anyone we can we can bring back. Yeah, you know what? I never had a chance to play with any of the greats of the game. So I'm going to go really old school and I'm going to say Jack Arney and Gary. Okay. Nobody from outside of golf? Oh. Who's your inspiration outside of golf? Um, me, me dad, really. But I, play, I used to play with him and he's useless at golf anymore. He doesn't like playing. So I, I, can't even te- I can't even tempt my dad to play if I asked him if he wanted to play Augusta because he wouldn't want to hit the tee shots on the first. Okay, he can walk around. He could walk around. And, but it, yeah, no, it's... There's not really anyone, I think, outside of golf that, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mine are, mine are very much within okay. within the game. Okay. Do you share any of his religious leanings, your dad? Uh, yeah, we, we're, we're, all, we're, all, we're all, well, I say we're all, I'm not speaking for my brothers here, but yeah, we, we me and my wife are Christian. and Got Zach and Noah, these are some good biblical yeah, yeah, names. Yeah, yeah exactly. How deep it goes is depends on people's opinions and stuff, but yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, excellent. We'll end on that very special note. That was, note. That was, that was <laughs> really on the fence answer. <laughs> no. but, um, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. There we go. We shall, right end, we shall <laughs> end on that, surprisingly, <laughs> with that final question. But listen, thank you very much. Tak, tak for... Uh, tak uh, uh, for uh, bro. For that bro. Jak prate in the sense. All right, thank you very much. Danny Willett for joining us on Life on Tour. Thank you, thank Mr. Carter. To watch another European Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.